Let us not be so satisfied with the present, with deals and finances in hand, that we get blindsided. Everything that has given cricket its power and influence in the world of sports has started from the fan in the stadium. They deserve our respect and let us not take them for granted. Disrespecting fans is disrespecting the game. The fans have stood by our game through everything. When we play, we need to think of them. As players, the balance between competitiveness and fairness can be tough, but it must be found. If we stand for the game's basic decencies, it will be far easier to tackle its bigger dangers. Whether it's finding shortcuts to easy money or being lured by the scourge of spot fixing and contemplating any involvement with the betting industry. Cricket's financial success means it will face threats from outside the game and keep facing them. The last two decades have proved this over and over again. The internet and modern technology may just end up being a step ahead of every anti-corruption regulation in place in the game. As players, the, on the one way we can stay ahead for the game is if we are willing to be monitored and regulated closely, even if it means giving up a little bit of freedom of movement and privacy. If it means undergoing dope tests, let us never say no. If it means undergoing lie detector tests, let us understand the technology, what purpose it serves and accept it. Now lie detectors are by no means perfect, but they could actually help the innocent clear their names. Similarly, we should not object to having our finances scrutinized if that is what is required. When the first anti-corruption measures were put into place, we did moan a little bit about being accredited and depositing our cell phones with the manager. But now, we must treat it like we do, do an airport security because, as, because we know it is for our own good and our own security. Players should be ready to give up a little bit of personal space and personal comfort for this game which has given us so much. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Other sports have borrowed from cricket's anti-corruption measures to set up their own ethical governance programs and we must take pride in belonging to a sport that is professional and progressive. One of the biggest challenges that the game must respond to today, I believe, is charting out a clear roadmap for the three formats. We now realize that sports three formats cannot be played in equal number. That will only throw scheduling and the true development of players completely off gear. There is a place for all three formats though. We are the only sport that I can think of that has three versions. Cricket must treasure this originality. These three versions require different skills. Skills that have evolved, grown, changed over the last four decades. One impacting the other. Test cricket is the gold standard. It is the form the players want to play. The 50 over game is the one that has kept cricket's revenues alive for more than three decades now. 2020 has come upon us and it is the format people, the fans want to see. Cricket must find a middle path. It must scale down this mad merry-go-round that teams and players find themselves in. Heading off for two test tours and seven match ODI series and a few 2020s thrown in. Test cricket deserves to be protected. It is what the world's best know they will be judged by. Where I come from, nation versus nation is what got people interested in cricket in the first place. When I hear the news that a country is playing without some of its best players, I always wonder what do their fans think. People may not be able to turn up to watch test cricket, but everyone follows the scores. We may not be able to fill up 65,000 capacity stadiums for test matches, but we must actively fight to get as many as we can in, to create a test match environment that the players and the fans feed off. Anything but the sight of tests played on empty grounds. For that, we've got to play test cricket that people can watch. I don't think day-night tests or a test championship should be dismissed. In March of last year, I played a day-night first-class game for the MCC in Abu Dhabi. And my experience from that was that day-night test is an idea worth exploring. There may be some challenges in places where there is dew, but the visibility and durability of the pink cricket ball was not an issue. Similarly, a test championship where every team and player driving themselves to be winners of a sought-after title seems like it would have context to every game. Keeping tests alive may mean different innovations in different countries, maybe taking it to smaller cities, playing it in grounds with smaller capacities like New Zealand has thought of doing, maybe reviving some old venues in the West Indies like the old recreation ground in Antigua. When I was around seven years old, I remember my father taking a Friday off so that we could watch three days of test cricket together. On occasions he couldn't, 
I would accompany one of his friends just to soak in a day of test cricket and watch the drama slowly unfold. What we have to do is find a way to ensure that test matches fit into 21st century life through timing, environments, the venue they are held in. I'm still convinced that it can be done, <clears throat> even in our fast-moving world with a short attention span. We will often get told that test matches don't make financial sense, but no one ever fell in love with test cricket because they wanted to be a businessman. Not everything of value comes at a price. There is a proposal during the rounds about scrapping the 50-over game completely. I'm not sure I agree with that. I certainly know that the 50-over game helped us innovate strokes in our batting, which we were able to take into test matches. We all know that the 50-over game has been responsible for improving fielding standards all over the world. 